If I say metaverse and you've already checked out some of our Web3 game analysis videos, then you know that it's more of a desirable universe before being a game, and even before blockchain comes into play. At GA Meta, a metaverse is an IP, a lore, inspiring enough that we're willing to spend hours and hours there. Well, Sparkadia. The project we're talking about today has a different take on the metaverse, and that's a good thing. The metaverse is still pretty vague right now, with differing definitions without anyone having a definitive answer. So let's explore various possibilities, and the best will eventually emerge. Sparkadia focuses on gaming and social aspects before considering Web3. Their game-first, blockchain-second vision is unique and almost aligns with Meta's approach, where the experience takes precedence over utility or technology. The metaverse takes shape through gameplay experiences and community engagement. It's somewhat like a social hub, hence the node to Meta. Sparkadia's digital environment connects various games from studio WorldSpark, the company behind Sparkadia. The games themselves should drive players to connect. The hub, the Sparkadia metaverse, is a bonus that aims to promote social interaction and bring together players from different WorldSpark games in a virtual space. This is what we sometimes call crossverse or multiverse for Marvel fans. Blockchain, only where it's needed, can be seen in their approach. Blockchain, only where it's needed, can be seen in their approach. They don't rely on a play-to-earn model to attract players, but rather on gameplay. In other words, if the game is good, there's no need to pay to get players. And that's true. This also works with play-to-earn models in general. Balancing between promising rewards for players and game features isn't easy. But until now, many games focus on the IP and the lore. In this case, lore takes a backseat. It serves more as a general context for the game than a true IP. What's interesting here is that Sparkadia has effectively integrated blockchain. By making it a simple technological layer used in the background of the game, players won't need to be crypto-friendly to join. An invisible blockchain running in the background means that technical barriers like bridges, marketplaces, fees, or wallets won't need to be understood by players. In short, it's a great recipe for mass adoption. Indeed, if blockchain becomes a tool that games can use without creating friction in gameplay, that is, without adding the technicalities specific to the crypto world, then it's a win. The gaming industry could greatly benefit. It's a smart Web3 oriented vision, but also very user centric, or rather gamer centric in this case. It's true that from a certain point of view, Web3 games require some understanding of cryptos before playing. But then again, no one asks you to understand how a PS5 controller works before playing FIFA, right? Sparkadia gets it and is positioning itself in this niche. This mindset also applies to their interoperability promise. WorldSpark, the studio, plans to make assets for all its games interoperable only if it adds value to the game experience. And this should only apply to its games. So Ready Player One isn't coming anytime soon at WorldSpark. For a bit of background, the game Edinburgh, which we'll discuss in more detail later, was created in 2016. It started as a simple hobby of the CEO who didn't hesitate to invest 200,000 of his own money. Today, seven years later, a highly skilled professional team is working on the project. Since 2016, progress made is just incredible. 2022 was the year of investments and announcements. The project raised no less than 13 million, 3 million in seed round and 10 million in private sale, and 200,000 K from the first NFT collection sale. This provides visibility for the coming years. 2023 is and will be the year of realization, as detailed in the roadmap. In May 2023, the token sale will begin, and in June 2023, the beta will open its doors. The game combines Brawler and MOBA elements, so expect some intense action. It's 100% free to play, with no purchasable items for better in-game performance. The available NFTs are simply cosmetic. Edinburgh focuses on team battles with a round system and skill shot type spells, emphasizing accuracy. It's heavily inspired by the game Battle Right. In 5 vs 5 matches, different heroes have unique abilities that increase throughout the game. The gameplay revolves around capturing the flag. Well, it's a ball in this case, but you get the idea. There's a ball at the center that you need to bring to the enemy's base while fighting to maintain possession. You can make passes, which is one of the skill shot type abilities, and of course, you can intercept as well. Matches are played in three rounds. You need to score a certain number of points to win the round, and there's a shopping phase between each. The game has a few nuances. At the beginning of each round, the territory limit is in the middle of the field. The limit shifts based on the position of the ball on the map, in favor of the team in possession of the ball. This concept of team territory is pretty cool, I think. 
Players on the team within their territory have bonuses, like increased speed. Advancing territory also disables enemy defenses. Next, items can be picked up on the map. Lastly, there's a choice of team blessing at the beginning of each round. For example, your base's defense can be improved. On this point, it's quite original. It's a beautiful blend. So what does Edinburgh offer in terms of tech and blockchain, and how does it work? Firstly, Edinburgh runs on the IMX blockchain, which is currently the most interesting choice for a gaming project. For the game itself, they went to Unreal Engine 5, and that's pretty cool. Now, let's review the details of everything you'll find in Edinburgh. Regarding NFTs, there are several types. Collections. Several are planned with the first one, Sparkadia Origin, already partially released. This first collection had 80,000 NFTs with 8 heroes and 10,000 sets. More sales are scheduled with 10,000 NFTs already sold. The mint price is $20, and the resale price is currently also $20. If you get 8 different hero NFTs, the complete series, you'll have certain benefits, like bonus tickets, discounts on future sales, a trophy you can display on your land, VIP access to special reward pools, and access to alpha testing on weekends. Modifiers. These are bonuses for the players, but offer no other in-game advantages. Lands, or dwellings as they call them. Crafting stations, which allow you to craft NFTs. Perks, which are bonuses for the crafting stations, items, and cosmetics. Let's go over each element. Modifiers are NFTs that offer a passive bonus to the player. These bonuses come in various rarity levels, with the bonus effect increasing with rarity. You can obtain them through crafting, reward pools, game achievements, or the marketplace. You must display them on your land or your dwelling to benefit from the bonus effects. These bonuses might include crafting advantages, additional ticket generation, better rewards in pools, and more. Note that these modifiers will give no PvP gameplay advantage. You can also boost your modifiers for a short period using Sparks tokens. Dwellings and land plots are unique to each player. They aren't explorable zones on a map, but more like a dedicated space for players, where each player can visit another's dwelling. It's somewhat similar to fiefs in World of Warcraft or Island in Animal Crossing. Dwellings will be available as NFTs with five rarity levels. Uncommon, Rare, Epic, Legendary, and Mythic. Each rarity will have different characteristics. Size, number of slots for modifiers, dwelling advantages, and so on. Each rarity level will be sold during different pre-sales. The basic rarity level, common, is granted to all players for free. Dwellings have several uses. To access your NFT collections, to display your badges, titles, trophies, screenshots, and so on. To place modifiers and slots to activate them, as mentioned earlier. To access your hero card. To access your crafting station. Presumably, all ancillary elements of the game will take place in the dwelling. You can also decorate it. On paper, this is pretty interesting. We'll see what the prices for these dwellings will be. These are NFT tools necessary for in-game crafting. There's a supply of 200,000 stations. Some are distributed to dwelling owners during the land sales, with the station's rarity matching the dwellings. The rest can be obtained through ticket pool rewards and staking pools. The crafting station is located in the player's dwelling. Like dwellings, there are five rarity levels. You can upgrade your station by crafting, which generates XP. When you reach the max, you can pay a fee in jingles to level up. You can reach the max rarity this way. Note the station's rarity determines the max rarity of items you can craft. Players without stations can still craft, but at an additional cost, and a portion of the royalty is going to the players with stations. However, those players need to be online. This process doesn't require player interaction as Edinburgh aims for automation or an order book. Players who make their stations available receive a portion of the crafting XP and tickets. If no station is available, the game will execute the craft directly, preventing any shenanigans. Stations will also allow you to dismantle NFT items to recover blueprints, the raw materials for crafting other items. Stations have slots for adding perks. These perks offer random bonuses for a limited duration, reduced crafting time, increased royalties, reduced crafting fees, the ability to craft items one level rarer than the station, and so on and so forth. You can obtain these perks using jingles, which we'll discuss later. Remember that jingles let you get perks, and perks are bonuses. You can also use jingles to upgrade perks before they expire or extend their duration. The system seems nice without being groundbreaking. However, if stations are upgradable to the max level, it could pose a medium-term risk. Staying on crafting, note that it also requires jingles to be discussed next. Time, as always, and exchangeable blueprints. For example, the item patterns you want to craft. Blueprints are single use. If you've been paying attention, we've mentioned tickets several times. 
But what are they? Simply put, they're the in-game resource that allows you to participate in reward pools. This resource isn't exchangeable since it's not an NFT. You have a maximum of one month to use these tickets. Reward pools let you obtain in-game items like Spark tokens. You can get tickets by completing ticket passes, similar to season passes. Single quests not limited to a season. You can also get tickets by staking your Spark tokens. If you want more tickets, it's possible. We mentioned modifiers earlier. That's one option. You can also craft for other players or own complete NFT collections. These will be part of your exclusive advantages. Let's clarify what ticket passes are now. They allow you to obtain in-game rewards like cosmetics, XP boosts, and emotes, to name a few. Once completed, meaning you've reached the end of the mini quest with the ticket pass, you'll be credited with tickets. There are three types of tickets, free, premium, and ludicious. Each ticket type offers different rewards. Ludicious will provide more rewards than free or rewards that are harder to obtain. Now let's move on to reward pools. Each month, players will have to access these pools. They contain on-chain items such as NFTs and Spark tokens. Players must submit tickets to the pool for a chance to receive rewards and they can submit as many as they want. The distribution of rewards to the winning ticket is entirely random. Rewards are replenished each month, but are based on the total number of tickets submitted the previous month. This helps adjust the distributed rewards according to the number of players and prevents, in theory, flooding the market with NFTs and tokens dropped in large quantities. To wrap up this game-specific section, we need to talk about Sparkadia's internal ecosystem currency, which is off the chain. To wrap up this game-specific section, we need to talk about Sparkadia's internal ecosystem currency, which is off-chain. Jingles. You can obtain this in-game currency with fiat money by crafting for other players or by exchanging tokens. Keep in mind that the reverse is not true. Jingles allow players to purchase ticket passes, craft NFTs, buy items or services from WorldSpark Studio, and do almost anything in-game and or paid, as everything revolves around Jingles. In short, Jingles are the foundation of Sparkadia. Depending on the games within Sparkadia's metaverse, it's possible that more off-chain currencies will emerge and be used exclusively within certain games. Jingles wouldn't be an exception. Having its own internal currency is very typical for a game. So far, nothing surprising. However, be cautious as you can convert Spark tokens into Jingles, but not the other way around. We have to wait and see what this will lead to in the long term. Edinburgh relies on the Spark token for its ecosystem. The token has a supply of 1 billion tokens, and it seems to be directly on the IMX blockchain. As for its distribution, here's what the team has planned. One important thing to note, 50% of rewards for players is pretty huge. Compared to other projects, Edinburgh is way ahead. If we wanted to be cheeky, we could compare it to Axie, which is quite similar in this aspect, but unfortunately has faced some setbacks. So be cautious about this seemingly generous offering. Distributing tokens is great, but it needs to be done right. Another surprising point, no vesting, or at least nothing announced. We'll have to see if it changes in that regard during the sale in May 2023. So what's the purpose of this token? First off, forget about governance. On that front, the game stands out from others, and that's not a bad thing. We tend to shove governance everywhere, even when it's unnecessary. Next, you'll be able to extend the lifespan of your perks. Stake your tokens to get utility NFTs and tickets, exchange them for jingles, participate in tournaments, and customize your utility portrait. As for staking, the rewards come in three types, dwellings, crafting stations, and tickets. By staking Spark tokens, you earn points over a certain period. The number of points will depend on the amount staked and the duration of the lockup. The duration acts as a multiplier. Once you reach a certain staking points threshold, you can claim an uncommon dwelling. You can then end the staking, retrieve this uncommon dwelling and your tokens, and keep your staking to aim for a rare dwelling, essential to the next level up. The more you stake, the better it'll be. But if you're not patient, you can directly burn the stake tokens and immediately upgrade the dwelling to the next level. However, you'll give up your staked spark tokens in the process. You can also get crafting stations with the same operational principle. Tickets are regularly earned during staking. In principle, the idea of a reward system that improves over time is pretty smart. But aside from the staking aspect, the rest seems a bit light. We're left wanting for more information to fully understand the mechanics. Two other crucial points still appear quite unclear. The fees and revenue sources. Clearly, there's no info on that front. All we know is that they aim to create a viable game by focusing on gameplay experiences and the fact that players will spend money for the fun it provides. That's all. As for the marketplace, it will take place on IMX, the take advantage of its global order book. 
but we don't know much more than that. In short, there's still a lot of uncertainty. Despite some vague intentions, Edinburgh aims to be at the forefront of esports. But how? By what means? And with whom? We're still waiting for more information. They plan to host regular online tournaments, requiring entry fees that will generate some revenue for Edinburgh, while winners will share the rewards. The project is mainly supported by Web3 players, notably including Anna Monica. In fact, just like with Aurori, Alameda Research is involved as well. A bit of a bummer. With such grand ambitions, one might wonder if the team behind Edinburgh is solid enough. At first glance, yes. On the founder site, we have a multidisciplinary team with experience in video game development. As for the core team, it's pretty heavy duty. This is the major strength of the project. Almost every team member has at least 10 years of experience in gaming in major studios like Riot, EA, Bungie, Ubisoft, Activision, Hi-Rez, Blizzard, Epic, and even Pixar and Marvel. Impressive, right? The team includes nine former Riot employees, which makes up almost 50% of the team. We have Edmundo Sanchez, Chief Creative Officer, who was an art director at Riot for nearly 15 years. Sebastian Cardoso, Chief Operations Officer, who has around 15 years of experience as an executive producer, slash production director at Riot, EA, Crytek, and more. Tristan Root, Chief Technology Officer, who spent 15 years at Bungie as an engineering manager. Alvin Lee, Principal Artist, who held the same position at Riot, Capcom, Marvel, and others. In short, whether it's Web 2 or Web 3, in terms of gaming, they've got it covered with such talent. If you want more details, check out the list on their website. However, there's a noteworthy caveat. There's no internal Web3 expertise. It's not common, but not surprising either. They're capitalizing on their talents and will likely outsource the rest, including Web3. As for advisors, they have some strong profiles. The studio's vision is clear. Edinburgh should dominate the esports scene with a competitive and impactful game. Considering advisors like Kevin Chang, and Jonathan Bloom Shell, who are well versed in battle right and MOBA heavily focused on team combat and skill shots, it makes sense to have them on board for Edinburgh, which shares similarities with the game. To wrap things up, what can we take away from Sparkadia and Edinburgh? The team is solid and highly skilled in gaming. They're truly industry monsters. However, when it comes to Web3, it's a bit more fragile. Their metaverse vision is interesting and quite unique compared to current projects. Meta's experience doesn't paint a bright future for social hubs that solely rely on it, but Sparkadia is also a game studio, so the social hub could quickly become a gaming hub, which would be incredible. It reminds me of the movie Wreck-It Ralph, where Ralph and the other characters end up in a sort of bus station where all the games are plugged in. So is this vision a strength or a weakness? We'll see as the metaverse definition is still being developed. What's certain for now is that the lore isn't a deciding factor for them. It's all about the game and the experience. Regarding the blockchain and Web3 side, we mentioned its fragilities. Be cautious, as the economic model is rather unstable. The tokenomics is incomplete, the use cases are insufficient, and the project's revenue sources lack clarity. WorldSpark has observed that project attracting players seeking to extract value face a significant sustainability issue. That's quite true, and we've reached the same conclusion at GA Meta. That's why distributing tokens as rewards seems to be an unsustainable model, or else it requires very tight constraints. We'll likely see a shift towards game models that only distribute NFTs. So WorldSpark's general idea is to have a model that attracts and retains players because the game experiences are fun, not for potential gains. We're moving away from the traditional play and earn or play to earn models. In principle, we agree, but it's essential to ensure the tokenomics are solid. For now, Sparkadia, or Edinburgh, appears to be a project with great promises, but nothing tangible, other than an enticing and clear roadmap that promises a game by summer 2023. It's a good start, but we'll have to keep an eye on announcements and see how the community reacts to the game's release and the token presale. It's undoubtedly a gamble, but at GMeta, we'll be watching very closely.